Right, I'm Harold Rivera. The fiery epidemic of arson at black churches continues. Jesse Jackson will join us in a bit to give us his take on the crisis. Closing arguments began in the Polly Kloss trial. Reaction from her dad, Mark, live later in the program. Up front tonight, this man who joins me here in Fort Lee is outraged. He's also a legal legend, Vincent Pugliosi, who will forever be known as the tough-talking prosecutor who put Charles Manson behind bars. During his eight-year career in the L.A. District Attorney's Office, Vince was successful in 105 out of 106 felony jury trials. Uh, that included winning 21 consecutive murder cases for the prosecution. He later wrote Helter Skelter about the Manson murders. It is the best-selling true crime book in the history of publishing. Now Vince has set his sights on Simpson with this powerful new book. It's called Outrage, The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder. In it, he depicts the Simpson trial as a travesty of justice and a showcase of incompetence. Simpson made a statement to the cops. We'll start right at the beginning. First of all, hi, Vince. Nice to see you. Beginning show. Uh, <clears throat> Simpson spoke twice. He spoke to the cops, as you know, the statement he gave when he got back to L.A. on the 13th, and then he spoke, uh, you know, in, in terms of his uh, would not, could not, did not. Right. So we'll run both those clips, and then we'll start. This prosecution team didn't lose today. I deeply believe that this country lost today. Justice was not served. I and my family will do everything in our power to bring about the kind of change that won't allow what happened today to ever happen to another family again. Mr. Simpson, good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. As much as I would like to address some of the misrepresentations made about myself and Martha and Nicole uh, concerning our life together, I'm mindful of the mood and the stamina of this jury. jury I have confidence, uh, a lot more it seems than Ms. Clark has, of their integrity, and uh, that they will find, as the record stands now, that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this uh, crime. I have four kids, two kids I haven't seen in a year. They ask me every week, Dad, how much longer All right. is this crowd over? All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Simpson, you do understand your right to testify as a witness? Yes, I do. All right. And you choose to rest your I case at this point? All right. Thank you very much, sir. How did you get the injury on your hand? I don't know. Well, not the first time. I know I was that when I was in Chicago. I know how. But at the house, I was just running around. And was, how did you do it in Chicago? I broke the glass. I just was, you had, one of you guys had just called me, and I was in the bathroom, and I just kind of went bonkers for a little bit. Is that how you cut it? As you know, not, as you know, not only did the prosecution not introduce Simpson's statement into evidence, they fought very hard, very aggressively to keep it out of evidence. Vince Bugliosi, you believe that was one of their cardinal sins? Well, there were so many. Uh, yeah. You've read the book, right, Harold? I've read every word, every page. It's page after page after page, example after example, just unbelievable incompetence. I mean. Uh, in many instances, if you've read the book, as you did, uh, we're going beyond incompetence. I mean, incompetence implies within the normal range of human behavior. We're talking about into the area of unprecedented, unheard of, bizarre, unique. If you didn't show up for work, Geraldo, I wouldn't say that you were incompetent. Incompetent is showing up for work and doing a terrible job, right? Literally, in many, many areas here, they literally did not contest. They, they conceded by default key issues in this case, like conspiracy, but people don't know that. Okay, let's, let's do point by point. What about that statement? Why should they have introduced that well, statement? Well, that's not the most incriminating part of the statement. Right, there. he says... Later, later on... He clearly it, states that he cut himself out of his house. Here's a guy that admits dripping with blood on the night of the murders in his car, home, and driveway, has no idea how he got cut, and the prosecution didn't introduce that statement. I mean, number one, when you say you don't know how you got cut, and it's a deep cut to your left middle finger, we're not talking about a little nick or scratch. That statement alone 
is, is preposterous on his face and shows an unmistakable consciousness of guilt. But much, much more importantly, Geraldo, what is the likelihood, what is the, the statistical probability that around the very same time that Ron and Nicole were brutally murdered, this guy supposedly innocently cuts himself very badly on his left middle finger? We're talking about DNA numbers, one out of 10 million, one out of 5 million. And when you cut yourself, uh, if you're an adult, uh, unless you're in a frantic, frenzied state, as he obviously was in, you stop the flow of blood with your hand or your handkerchief, uh, and you put on a bandage. You don't bleed all over the place. Extremely incriminating. And Tom Lang said, we pushed Vince, we pushed and pushed to get it in, but Marsha didn't, did not want to let it come in. And the reason is mind-boggling, the reason. Tell us the reason. I mean, I well, the, know the reason yeah. to be that uh, the fear of the prosecution was that Simpson's statement, if left uh, unrebutted by cross-examination would give him an opportunity basically to plead his innocence at a time <laughs> when the, but the that is president silly. did That's not want that. That's silly beyond imagination. They didn't want the jury to hear Simpson denying guilt without us taking the stand. But the jury already knew he denied guilt. He pled not guilty. That's why they were having a trial. It's unbelievable. I mean, you're going to keep out extremely powerful, incriminating evidence of guilt because you don't want the jury to hear something or prevent them from hearing something that they already know? It's mind-boggling. So I'm not making this up, by the way. They say, Darden says that in his book. We don't want the jury to hear him denying guilt. Uh, without any equivocation, you believe that Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden were guilty of gross incompetence? Uh, well, beyond gross incompetence. We're, we're talking here, and it, there's one thing about me, Raul. I never make an allegation or a charge unless I support it. You know I support it in spades in this book. We're talking here F minus. It does not get any worse. It cannot get any worse. And it's page after page after page. And you know that. You read. You read the book. When you talk about the cut on the hand, not only is he cutting the, uh, the hand at about the same time his wife is being brutally murdered right. and has no explanation for it, but also you have the empirical evidence at the scene, the five Bundy blood drops, which I believe are the strongest evidence against Simpson. Yes. Always were. Yep. Explain. Well, well they're, they're immediately to the left, obviously, of the killer's bloody shoe prints. And by DNA, they're identified as Simpson's, uh, Simpson's blood. When you have your blood at the murder scene, Harrell, it's the end of the ball game. There's nothing more to say. I mean, to deny guilt when your blood is at the murder scene reminds me of um, the comic um, Richard Pryor saying, it's like a man getting caught in flagrante delicto with another woman and telling his wife, uh, whom are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? He cannot be innocent with his blood at the murder scene. If this man is innocent, then these two poor people are still alive. What about the allegation, of course, that the blood even there was planted? Well, they didn't argue that in their final summation. They argued cross-contamination. And Marsha Clark, unbelievable, with, unbelievable with, with two DNA experts working full-time there and having the, the assistance of two DNA experts. In her final summation, she did not point out that if this had been cross-contamination, i.e., the blood came from a reference vial of Simpson's, then it would have had EDTA in it, right? And it didn't. And it would have had a high concentration of DNA. But the blood was degraded because it had been left out in the sun for a while, right? So she didn't even make those arguments. How don't you make arguments like that when you're on a case for an entire year and you have two DNA experts helping you out? She did not make those arguments in her final summation. Just to be very clear. So there couldn't that. have been crossing into contamination. You're saying that there was not even an allegation by the defense that those five blood drops were planted at Bundy. They implied it during the trial, but when it came down to final summation, even these defense attorneys who had the gonads of 10,000 elephants. The gonads of 10,000 Did elephants. not have that the guts. That could have been an alternate yeah, title. Yeah, did not have the guts to say that these, these LAPD officers planted Simpson's blood directly to the left of the killer's bloody shoe prints leaving the scene of the crime. Even they didn't do it. Let's underline even they, because these people were unbelievable. So the sole defense explanation for the five blood cross contamination at, cross contamination at the LA crime at the LAPD yeah okay SID would you like to put those three notions into one paragraph for us <laughs> Wait, right what what, what give three me a, give me a all right you've got uh, the Simpson cutting his hand at the same time his wife is you want me to no. do it I can do it go ahead yeah you better do no, it no go ahead you do it well, I, don't, I don't know what you mean you he put, cuts his hand yeah. at the same time well, there's all types his wife of is evidence. being murdered these, these are just a few no, no, things no I just want this one we're going to concentrate one at a time he cuts his hand at the same time his wife is being yeah. murdered. The same hand, apparently, that the murderer got cut. That's right. It's a deep cut for which he has no explanation. Yeah, right. His blood is at the murder scene. Yeah. I could throw it. How eight... much would you have spent on that in your closing argument? 
Well, I would have argued by closing argument, first place I'd have put four or five hundred hours of preparation. These people were up the night before they gave it preparing their final summation, which is inexcusable. But that issue alone right there, I'd argued probably for a half hour alone. And they just touched it. Well, they, they, didn't, they couldn't even talk too much about it because they didn't introduce the statement. So they try to get it in in a roundabout way. Instead of playing the statement for the jury to hear, Simpson's voice, where he's admitting, dripping with blood on the night of the murders, and he says, here's what he said when they asked him, how did you get cut? These are his exact words, not a paraphrase. I don't know. They asked him later on, how did you get cut, O.J.? I have no idea, man. The jury didn't hear that. They didn't know about that. Are you aware that several of the jurors have said, when they've learned about this other evidence, we've just touched on a little bit of it here, that they were, at, these aren't my words, absolutely shocked that the prosecution did not offer evidence like that, that if they had known it, the result probably would have been different. One of them came right out and said, and it's in the book, I got the quote, I would have convicted him if I'd have known about this evidence. You state without equivocation that you've put people on death row for far, with far less evidence. Oh my God, are you kidding? Much, much less ev evidence than this I've put people on death row, of course. Is there any way that there could have been a conviction in this case, given this jury? With an F minus presentation, okay, as dreadful as this prosecution was, the first vote that this jury took, 10-2, there was a black and a white juror that voted guilty. Now, by extrapolation, if you had an A plus performance, which we didn't have here, a halfway decent prosecution, there would have been a conviction in this case, almost assuredly, if not, at an absolute minimum, a hung jury. Bugliosi is outraged. He's written a book to that effect. There it is. The Five Reasons O.J. Simpson got away with murder. I told you when this began that I had the hardest job. Nobody wants to do anything to this man. We don't. There's nothing personal about this. But the law is the law. And it applies to us, it applies to you, it has to apply to him. What was wrong with that? Oh my God. It is, uh, the reason I, I aired that little clip is, oh it, I believe God. it is an example that, of something you find very yeah, that, that, that's unprofessional. A, that's another section of the book. Marsha Clark, in picking this jury, then I'll get into what he just said, tells the jury, listen to this, tells the jury that this guy is a good looking guy, he's very popular, and then, he's, then she says to him, he's so sympathetic, sympathetic, this is not a fun place for me to be. Now, can you imagine this guy with, with a knife stabbing these poor people, 37 stab wounds, poor Nicole was almost decapitated. Can you imagine the horror and the fright in, in the victim's eyes at the time that he was killing them? And this prosecutor, who's representing the people of the state of California, fighting for justice, saying, this is not a fun place for me, meaning, you know, I really don't want to be here, but I've been assigned to the case, so what can I do? Then she takes it a step further and makes the most ill-advised statement that any prosecutor has ever made to a jury, as far as I know, and says, you may not like me for bringing this case. I'm not winning any popularity contest for doing so. Now, what the heck is that telling the jury? Well, that's essentially telling the jury that the majority of people, if you're losing the uh, popularity contest, the majority of people outside that courtroom don't even want this guy to be prosecuted. And by necessary extension, if you come back with a verdict of guilty, you're going to be going against the majority of people. Then, then, then we have uh, Darden in his final summation saying, nobody wants to hurt this guy. Uh, we don't. Nothing personal here. Almost apologizing for prosecuting this guy. Wherever you look in this case, there's nowhere that you can look without finding the incompetent fingerprints of the prosecution in this case. It's staggering. And you agree with that, don't you, after reading the book? Well, I, I think that this is a wonderful book, extremely well written, and your arguments make total sense to me. But in a sense to me, you're preaching to the converted, because I believe as you do that Simpson got away with murder. In what I was interested in doing in reading the book was to see if it was all Monday morning quarterbacking. That is easy for you to say because right. uh, now you're looking right. back and right. reviewing. But uh, checking the contemporaneous news accounts, you held all these views or most of them of during course. the trial. Of okay, course. we're right back. That was the short story. We're right back. Is it possible that you have forgotten that act on your part? No, it's not possible. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger 
or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. He lied, yet you call him a victim. Well, yeah, yeah, he, he's a victim because here, here's a fellow that uh, is awakened in the middle of the night. He goes to a crime scene, does absolutely nothing wrong at all, and maybe his life is uh, destroyed. And I'm, I'm not a, an apologist for uh, Mark Furman, the fact that he's been a racist in the past. We're getting into another area of incredible incompetence. What you do with a Mark Furman, you sit him down in a room and you tell him the facts of life. You don't do what Darden did, ask him, have you ever used the N-word? And he says no, and you leave it at that. No, you tell him the facts of life. You tell him that you know he used these words because there was a lot of evidence that the DA had, and he's going to testify to the truth on that stand. You make him cough it up. And then you put that evidence on yourself, you put it behind you, it becomes a dead issue. When the Furman tapes surface later on, they probably... Started is easy. The hard part is knowing when to stop. What happened? Are you aware that that Furman had a basically good record at the LAPD? Ninety-four. The last time he used the N-word was in nineteen eighty-eight. He had black friends in 1994. He was getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to play basketball with black fellow officers. Did you know, and it's in the book, when I say did you know, you know, but do the people know that Mark Furman, as late as 1994, worked hard to free a black man, Eric Harris, to free a black man charged with the murder of a white man when he came upon exonerating evidence. Now, when you have... The Furman Tate's tapes, just absolutely devastating. Don't you try to mitigate the damage a little bit? Phillips, his partner, Furman's partner, gave that information to the DA's office. They didn't offer it. They joined in the vilification. Not one word, not one syllable in defense of Mark Furman. There's, a, there's ten things that I could tell you about how they handled the Mark Furman issue. It's all bad. It's all negative. You read the book. Did they treat Furman in a way they should have treated Simpson, the prosecution? Well, yeah, there's no question that they vilified and maligned the prosecution as well as the defense, Furman, much more than um, Simpson. And the nitwit media, I mean, who can always be counted upon to do an absolute minimum of thinking, they treated Furman's take in the fifth, and he's not even on trial. They treated his take in the fifth with big headlines much more seriously than Simpson refusing to take the witness stand and testify in his defense. That's the media. Okay, let's get to the, uh, the slow speed chase what was there again another piece of evidence like the well, statement that never came in and you are very very harsh in your criticism well, of the prosecution for not yeah, putting that yeah, slow speed chase. As, as i say the book is just page after page of this stuff but uh, after the slow speed chase as you know uh they find uh in simpson's possession a gun a passport a cheap disguise several fresh changes of underclothing uh and in ac Collins' pockets eight thousand seven hundred fifty dollars worth of cash and he says he just got the money. He told the police he got the money from Simpson inside the Bronco. Again, why didn't they introduce it? Because during the chase, Simpson is talking on a cellular phone and telling everyone that he's innocent, denying guilt. And they didn't want the jury to hear that he was denying guilt without taking the stand. You're going to keep evidence like this out to prevent the jury from hearing something that they already know. It's mind-boggling. When we think we're in the cellar, the absolute cellar, of incompetence. Darden comes along with his drill and takes us to new and lower depths, previously unimaginable depths of incompetence. In his book, he says, now strap yourself into your seat here now, Geraldo. I'm there. I'm okay, ready. because what I'm going to tell you is so far out and mind boggling that it's as bright as you are, it may go over your head because it's not going to register. Try It'll be like I'm speaking a foreign language to you, okay? All right. Amen. Darden says in his book that another reason for not introducing the slow speed chase is that to do so, even with all the evidence that they gathered later, would focus on Simpson's state of mind during the chase. And he didn't want to do that. Why? Because he said as a result of the LAPD chasing Simpson, he started to cry and he was threatening suicide. And Darden said he feared that uh, Cochran would get up in his final summation and garner sympathy for, for Simpson by arguing to the jury, look what the LAPD did. They almost made O.J. blow his brains out. Did you hear what I just told you? Did you hear what I just told you? Mm -hmm. In other words, in other words, 
uh, even though even though there's a warrant out for my arrest for for two murders I can refuse to turn myself in and instead try to escape but if you come after me if you come after me and because of it I get upset and I start to cry and I threaten suicide I'm gonna use that against you now if you can take that Geraldo if you can take what I just told you that type of logic without being staggered you, you, you wouldn't even notice, Harold, if Mike Tyson hit you with his best left hook. I mean, you wouldn't even blink your eyes. You'd laugh at Mike. You'd laugh at him. Darden's position and reasoning is, is unbelievable. It's mind-boggling. And yet this was the mentality all the way through this case, the mentality of the prosecutors that were representing the people of the state of California. And people wonder why this guy's out playing golf with a smile on his face. Last month he's in the Bahamas, okay? And he reports back that he's never been received so well. He's got more lipstick on him than he's ever had. And people wonder why that's so. If people want to know why this case is lost, okay, why this case was lost, as you agree, the answer's in that book right there. You're certainly not going to find it out. I agree. The answer's in that book. Okay. Ito, you say, bears some of the blame. Clearly, it wasn't all the prosecution's incompetence. Right. Mark Furman would never have risen to the heights or sunk into the depths that he did of importance but for Judge Ito. This, yeah, 30 seconds before the break. Okay, this was not a, a uh, uh, there was no racial issue in this case, just a manufactured racial issue. Uh, this was simply a case of a man who happened to be black, who murdered his former wife and male companion, uh, nothing more, nothing less. The defense, showing no respect, no concern for the black community, exploited the black community to the black community's own detriment just to help a guy who's black and color only. The, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll finish, finish that off there. Well, the OC is out. What is your opinion about the existence of these transfer stains? Overall. Only opinion I can give under this circumstance, something wrong. There are many, many reasonable doubts buried right in the heart of the scientific evidence in this case, and we have demonstrated them. And we don't have to prove them, but the evidence shows it. So, in the words of Dr. Lee, something is wrong. Something is terribly wrong with the evidence in this case. You cannot trust it. It lacks integrity. It cannot be a basis for a verdict of beyond a reasonable doubt. If they went easy on Simpson in their portrayal of the defendant, they were reverential about Dr. Henry Lee. <laughs> Dr. Henry Lee should have been ridden out of town on a rail, okay? I talk about the in-the-air phenomenon. It, it's, it, it's, it's kind of a subtle type of phenomenon that contributed to the... Uh, Everyone's the saying that he'd never get convicted. Yeah, okay. Dr. Henry Lee was reputed to be one of the top forensic sleuths, right? If not the. Yeah, in, in the entire country. Uh, Ito, this silly Judge Ito, tells Hank Goldberg, if I were you, just ask him a couple questions and then get out because of his reputation. Well, one thing among many, I mean, he was totally discredited by William Bodziak, the FBI agent, but one thing among many. About the shoe print yeah, that he saw. unbelievable. He says he saw a shoe print at the Bundy crime scene that didn't match the Bruno Mogli. If anyone watching is Italian, I guess it would be Molly, G before Alan Italian is, is silent. Didn't match the Bruno Mogli. You Mogli, should know. Yeah, Bruno, Bruno <laughs> Mogli. Yeah, that's right. Bruno Mogli uh, shoe print. Didn't match it. Ergo, what? The inference that we're talking about a second assailant. Very, very helpful to the defense. Very, very damaging to the uh, prosecution. Bodziak comes along, goes out to the scene with the photograph that Lee had taken, okay? And he sees that shoe print. And you know what the shoe print is of? It is a shoe print, but it's the shoe print of the worker that laid that cement years and years ago. I mean, it's a permanent indentation. You can feel the, the, the ridges and the depressions, okay? Why didn't the jury, from that point on, disregard everything this man said? Because, Geraldo, there's this phenomenon of seeing what you expect to see. The majority, the greater bulk of mankind, uh, people hear uh, the music, not the lyrics of human events. I don't know if it was Voltaire or the, the uh, New England naturalist Thoreau who said this, this constant struggle to see what's directly in front of my eyes, see. They didn't see that. What they saw up there was the top sleuth in the country. And one of them said, oh, he was world, world renowned. They totally... 
totally ignored it. But, he should have been ridden out of town on a rail. But they okay? seized on his statement as amplified by Barry Sheck and Johnny Cochran in both their closing arguments, something is wrong. That sentence became the sum total of Dr. Lee's testimony. Yes, and the prosecution didn't point out that when Lee was saying that, he was talking about only one little tiny part of this case, the transfer stains on those paper bindles. And there was an innocent explanation for that. The paper bindles that were enclosing the, the uh, cotton swatches that had the blood of Nicole's on it, there was, a, there was a transfer that same night from the cotton swatches to those paper bindles too. So it was innocent. But he was only talking about these little transfer stains, and he used the word something wrong, okay? And they, they appropriated it as their model for the entire case. And not once did the prosecution say, wait a while, he's just talking about this little tiny point. Marsha Clark, in her final summation, instead of talking about this permanent indentation, and this guy should be ridden out of town out of a rail, all he said, well, you know, Bodziak clarified, clarified what Dr. Henry Lee said. That's not what you do in your final summation. You ridicule this guy. How dare this guy take the witness stand and lead you folks to believe that there was a second print there that could have been the shoe print of a second assailant. She doesn't say anything like that. I mean, anything that you can mention, any issue that you mention, immediately I will give you gross incompetence, and many times going beyond gross incompetence. Let me make one point before I go any further. The good guys lost here, okay? And it hurts me to say the things that I'm saying, because no one from the beginning of this case was more pro-prosecution than I was. How do you fight Very, it? very supportive. If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. How do you fight that? How do, we, how do you fight that? Tell me. I fight it in the book. Among other things, the audacity of this guy to say, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. DNA fits better than anything, anything. Gloves, clothing, anything. If it's your DNA, DNA, it matches you to the exclusion of everyone on the face of this earth. And he's got the audacity to argue, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Incidentally, all they had to do, the prosecution here, is tell the judge, judge, that's a misstatement here. It's a misstatement. You can't allow them to tell the jury that because that leads the jury to believe, in effect, that if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. That's just as improper as the prosecution arguing if the DNA matches, you have to convict. And you can't do that. Now, shouldn't the prosecutor have said, Judge Ito, who should have done it on his own? You have to instruct this jury that that statement is a totally improper statement. And if he had done that, that statement, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit, actually would have been near to their... To the, to the defense's detriment. I explain it in much more detail in the book. Roll tape U. Do you have tape U? This is from Chris Darden's appearance on this program the uh, 22nd of March this year. Roll. I don't think it was Judge Ito's courtroom. And you've said to me before that you count Ito amongst the reasons this case was lost. I do count him amongst and the reasons. And you're reason. extremely critical of Judge Ito. Well, celebrity struck. Starstruck, yeah, I think so. Abandoned his gavel, right? Surrendered, Surrendered it. Surrendered his gavel. Um, in a case like this, and in all cases, you need a, a strong judge, a judge who is going to maintain uh, the focus on, 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 on the appropriate issues. And the issue in this case is guilt or innocence. It's murder, it's Nicole, it's Ron. Those are the issues in this case. Judge Ito called for short days at a time the trial was running on and on and on. He allowed too many objections. These are all excerpted uh, objections to Judge Ito's performance from Outrage, Vince Bugliosi's fine new book. Uh, and also ha asked to take a vacation shortly before the <laughs> verdicts came down. But aside from all that, you believe his key error was in allowing the N-word testimony to be introduced. Yeah, uh, so far the defense attorneys have gotten all the blame for injecting race into this case. And they deserve all the blame that they can get and then some. But for some reason, Ito has gotten a free ride on this issue. He doesn't get a free ride in my book. I blame him 100% for allowing race to become an issue in this case. Yes, they wanted to inject it, but he didn't have to allow it to come in. Not only on common sense grounds, but under 352 of the California Evidence Code, you keep that out. If the relevance of offered evidence is substantially outweighed by the probability of prejudice to the other side, you keep that out. And here, the relevance of, of Mark Furman using the N-word in the past uh, 10 years is extremely remote uh, at best. I mean, it, it's a non sequitur and a broad jump of Olympian proportions to conclude that just because he used the N-word, that he's going to go around framing uh, innocent people of murder. 
That's absurd. So Ito, under 352, should have kept that evidence out. And if he didn't want to follow 352 of the evidence code, he snubbed his nose, by the way, at the law throughout this case. If he didn't want to do that, then common sense will tell you. Every single day in America, thousands of white police officers arrest and investigate black suspects. Does anyone really believe in that? When these cases come to court, these thousands of cases, it's perfectly proper to ask every single one of these officers, have you ever used a racial slur in the last 10 years? And if they deny it, and you can prove that they did, have a separate satellite trial on that issue. So Ito was way off base on this issue, and the prosecution had to pay for Ito's sins. I want to comment on what Darden said about he didn't take charge of that courtroom. I believe Ito did take charge of that courtroom. What happens so much in life, you read uh, the caption of an article or an assertive statement in the opening paragraph, and then you read and, and you, you search in vain for the support for that. In his book, he makes a statement that Cochran took charge of that courtroom. I don't believe that. But if it's true, what you have to do then is what? Like I do here in this book, five, six, seven examples. So someone says, yes, he gives no evidence of that. In fact, his opening paragraph of his book, very disappointing, extremely disappointing. Here's a guy who claims that he looked into the eyes of these people and he knew this case was locked. Mm -hmm. That is pure drivel, okay? He doesn't believe it himself. In the very next paragraph, he says, my God, he's quoting himself when the verdict came in. My God, my God, my God, my God. What's he saying that if he, according to him, he already knew nine and a half months earlier that the case was lost. Does he know that in his own book, after the failed glove demonstration, he quotes himself as telling Garcetti, don't worry, we're going to win this case? Hasn't he even read his own book? He's got one paragraph in his book as to why this case was lost, okay? There's 356 pages in this book as to why this case was lost. According to him, it was lost before the case started, which is pure nonsense. This is the book, destined for the bestsellers, I have no doubt. The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder by Vincent Bugliosi, prosecutor of Charles Manson, author of Helter Skelter. Outrage, it's called. Vince. Did you enjoy the book? I did. It was terrific. It's sure to raise hackles and controversy, and we'll have Chris Darden on the program Thursday. Let, Let me respond. ask just one further point. Ask are there, are there a lot of things in this book There's that a, you did not know about and you have not heard discussed anywhere else? There are things in this book uniquely phrased, and I would never have thought them as strong as they were until I saw them in black and white. Uh, no, you didn't answer my question. Are there things yes, in this book? Yes, well, no, yes. Don't, don't yes, say yes if yes, it's not no, true. I, it would definitely are there be worth a, the 25 bucks. Are there a great number of things in this book that you did not know about that you have not heard anywhere else? Well, I'm a tough one to ask that because I have encyclopedic knowledge of this case. Okay. But I clearly think that this is the finest effort at, at uh, how, how should I say it? A uh, devil's advocating the prosecution case clearly that I have ever seen. And were you the prosecutor in the case? and you had the opportunity to follow this blueprint, I think Simpson would have been convicted. That is a pretty good endorsement. No one has ever mentioned before one minute, one minute to knock down nine and a half months of conspiracy allegation. That's all they argued, one minute, to convince the jury there was no conspiracy. And never even which is named, unbelievable. Never even named the 14 officers who yeah, saw unbelievable. the Bundy crime scene before Furman ever got there. Vince, good luck. Good to see you.